fascinated with Moses. How could I not? What an amazing Bible character. A son of slaves being raised as a prince and then being called by God to be the deliverer of his people, Israel. What a hero. But these things were not the real reason for my desire to be like Moses. Mostly, I just wanted to know God intimately. I wanted to hear his voice. I wanted God to talk to me, just like he talked to Moses. I desired God to use me to advance his kingdom purposes. So when I was 32 years old, I began to ask God to talk to me. I wanted my own burning bush. <laughs> Since then, God has spoken to me many times and in many different ways. So when my husband had this wild idea to go with Joel Richardson to Mount Sinai in Arabia and climb the mountain, I wanted to go too. I wanted to see what Moses saw. I wanted to walk where Moses walked to experience the scriptures in a way I had never done before. And most importantly of all, I wanted to meet God at the mountain. I wanted to see what he might tell me there. However, as I shared last time, going to Saudi Arabia made me a bit nervous. The greatest concern I had was being left alone at the camp while John hiked to the top of the mountain. After I arrived in Saudi Arabia, I realized my fears had been for naught. Nothing could have been further from the truth. The people of Saudi Arabia were generous, friendly, and kind, being very accommodating and welcoming. Not only that, our fellow travelers on the trip were other believers who shared an incredible connection, love for biblical archaeology, and Jesus Christ himself. Words cannot describe how it felt camping at the base of Jabal Maqwa, a high peak in the range known as Jabal El Waz. You can see in these pictures how the tents were set up for us and a beautiful Arabian carpet was rolled out on the sand. Pillows and chairs were set out for us to lean on and a campfire was roaring on a platform right in the middle of the carpet. In the distance, the sun was setting right over the mountain. We had arrived. Local Bedouins were cooking our buffet dinner over an open fire and the air was beginning to cool. By this time, I had forgotten all about being fearful. I was excited. In the morning, when John took off for the hike with the other members of the group, my new friend, one of the other non-climbers and I relaxed by the fire. We read and discussed the Exodus scriptures and prayed for the others. Then one of our drivers, an older Muslim man named Sultan, took us on our own personal hike and tour around the base of the mountain. He delighted in teaching the two of us all about the Bedouin shepherds and his flock of goats going by, but also the local plants and their uses. He carefully helped us climb over the rocks and we felt a sense of caring and protection. I began to chastise myself for having been so fearful and completely immerse myself in the experience. If you know me, the one thing you know is that I like birds. I was on the lookout for birds, but I was also fascinated with the plants. I wondered which one of these species of desert shrubs was the real burning bush. Here are some of the photos I took. What do you think? Notice anything about these desert plants? <laughs> That's right, they all have thorns. When I was studying before leaving the, for the trip, I was curious what the word Sinai meant. So I checked the Strong's lexicon. How about this? Thorny. We were at the base of Mount Thorny. Jabal Makla was covered with thorn bushes. That much was for sure. I would be remiss if I didn't mention these thorns, these things. Oh my gosh, they're like an inch and a half razor sharp and you walk by them the whole way up. Crazy.
crazy, 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 but we're getting there. As Salton continued to teach us about the plants and help us explore the area, my mind drifted back to Moses. In chapter two, we read that Moses fled the land of Egypt, being sought by Pharaoh for the murder of an Egyptian. In a sense, Moses had his own exodus or departure from Egypt and journeyed to the land of Midian. For 40 years, Moses walked over every square inch of the land of Midian, learning how to tend the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law. He must have wondered if he missed God someplace, but he didn't. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was waiting for the exact moment in time to reveal his plan to Moses in Midian at Mount Sinai. In chapters three and four then, we have the narrative of Moses at the burning bush, one of the most well-known accounts in the whole Bible. In these two chapters, not only do we learn about God's plan, but we also learn about his love and compassion for his chosen people and about his character and his holiness. For the first time in the scriptures, God's name is revealed. I am that I am. And even looking deeper at this burning bush that is on fire and not consumed, we hear the voice of Jesus Christ himself speaking from the bush. During this conversation, God calls Moses to be the deliverer of his people, choosing him to be his agent to Pharaoh for the purpose of setting his people free. The name of God, I am, is spelled with a yud, hey, vav, hey. Since the Hebrew language has no vowels, no one really knows how it's pronounced. In fact, it is said that the name of God was so holy to the Hebrews that they never said it out loud, choosing to substitute the name Adonai, or Lord, in its place. The closest rendition used today in English is Yahweh. So we will call God Yahweh from here out. When Moses saw that the bush was burning, but not consumed, he stopped and turned aside to look. That is when Jesus called to Moses from the bush. Moses, Moses. Now, if Yahweh ever calls out your name twice, look out, something important is coming. Moses was told to take off his shoes because the ground he was standing on was holy. As the intimate conversation continued, God revealed his plan with important details. Number one, Moses was given his mission to return to Egypt and meet with the elders of Israel, giving them an important message from Yahweh. God was going to deliver them. Number two, next, he was to go to Pharaoh and say this, our God met with us and we need to go three days into the wilderness to sacrifice to him. Number three, however, Pharaoh was going to say no. Four, then Yahweh was going to strike Egypt with his wonders. After that, Yahweh would give the Israelites favor with the Egyptians and the Hebrews would plunder the Egyptians, being given treasures of gold and silver and other valuables to take with them as they departed. To encourage Moses on the mountain, Yahweh then gave Moses tools to use as God's representative. He wanted to be sure the Israelites believed that Yahweh himself truly had appeared to Moses. First, he gave Moses a rod that could turn into a serpent and then back into a rod. This sign was to be for the Israelites first so that they would believe that Yahweh truly had spoken to Moses. Second, he gave Moses a leprous hand and then the ability to heal it whole again. This was given as a miracle sign, but also as a prophetic one. The Bible says, then it will be that if they do not believe you, nor hear the message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign. Often in the scriptures, it's helpful to have the confirmation of the second witness. 
More importantly, this prophetic utterance suggests that the first time around, there is still unbelief, even from God's chosen people. But the second time, they would believe. Jesus appeared to the Jews and did miracles when he came to earth the first time. But many did not believe in him. When he returns, many Jews will believe and be saved. Third, he instructs Moses to take water from the Nile River and pour it out onto the sand. The water would turn to blood. If the previous two miracles did not impress the Hebrew slaves, maybe this one would. God did perform the miracle through Moses, and it will happen again during the Great Tribulation, as it teaches in Revelation 16, 4 to 7. At this point, it seemed unnecessary to Moses to remind God that he was not eloquent of speech. Because of this, he makes the case that he could not possibly be Yahweh's spokesman. But God reminded him that he was challenging the creator of his mouth. <laughs> Dismissing his reluctance, God commanded him to go, promising that he would be with Moses and teach him what to say. He also told him that all the men who sought his life were dead. Since that strategy didn't work, Moses blurted out what was really in his heart. He was not sure he was up for the assignment. Oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever you will send. At this, God became angry, but assured Moses that even now his brother Aaron, who spoke very well, was on his way to meet him. Then Yahweh made it clear how he wanted to do business. God would teach Moses all he wanted him to say, and then Moses would relay the information to Aaron, who would be his spokesman. Dismissing him further, God says to Moses, basically, and don't forget to take the rod. So Moses returned to Jethro, seeking permission to return to Egypt, supposedly to check on his family. Moses packed up his wife and his sons and set out for Egypt, carrying the rod of God with him. While on the way, God gave Moses further directions. He was to use the rod to do the wonders of God before Pharaoh himself. But Moses was warned not to be surprised when Pharaoh said no to Moses' request. Right up front, Yahweh warned Moses that Pharaoh was going to say no, no. He would not let God's people go. Moses was to tell Pharaoh that God considered the people of Israel as his firstborn son. And because Pharaoh would not let his son go, he would bring judgment on the very heart of Pharaoh. He would kill his son. While they were on the way, something strange happened. This one incident gives us an insight into Moses' family dynamic. Yahweh, most likely in the form of an angel with his sword, was sent to kill Moses. Why? Moses had failed to circumcise his sons. This was an intolerable sin to God, for his chosen agent must be holy, and his children bear the sign of the covenant. However, Zipporah was angry at Moses was not in favor of the circumcision. No one knows exactly why. However, one thing is clear. Moses had been yielding to his wife in the command of God. He was putting the wishes of his wife over the direction and the will of Yahweh. In this stressful scene, Zipporah quickly circumcises her son, but throws the foreskin at the feet of Moses and yells, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. Most Bible scholars agree that Zipporah and her sons left Moses at this point and returned to her father. We don't hear of her again until Moses returns to Midian with his entire family in tow. The whole Israelite tribe, all two million of them. The chapter ends with Moses meeting Aaron on the mountain of God and sharing with him all of the words of Yahweh and the signs that he had given him. They traveled together 
back to Goshen and met with the elders of the people. Aaron spoke for God to the people and also showed them the signs that God had given Moses. The scripture then says, so the people believed. And the response to this visitation from God that came with the promise, worship. They worshiped and worshiped and thanked God for his voice in the burning bush and the plan for their redemption revealed at the holy mountain of God. I went into the camping trip at the base of Mount Sinai with great excitement and expectations. What would God reveal to me there? Would he call me to some new mission? Would he reveal more to me about himself? What treasure would I take home from the mountain of God? Reflecting back now, my expectations were completely fulfilled and I was not left wanting by my trip to the mountain of God itself. But the treasure God gave me that day was not in the way I might have anticipated. It was not in a burning bush. It was not even in a still small voice like Elijah, but it was a pearl of great price. You see, the treasure God gave me that morning at the mountain was a new friend, a friend that had a yearning for God and a passion for Jesus that matched my own. Did God speak to me that day? Yes, he spoke to me through her as we read out loud the story of the Exodus straight from the word of God and shared with each other what God was teaching us both through the experience. Sometimes God speaks to us audibly through a miracle experience or sometimes like Elijah through a still small voice. Other times God quickens our spirit while reading the word of God and sometimes speaks through the voice of a believing friend. I love my new friend and we still text each other back and forth to this day. I was not able to hike to the top of the mountain that day, but I was content hanging out with God and my new friend at the bottom. Oh yes, I forgot to tell you her name. Her name is Grace. Grace, I can't think of a better picture, can you? God gave me grace at the mountain. Overwhelmed by this thought, I realized that was what God wanted me to learn. It was the same gift that God had given in the moment to the Israelites. Grace, unmerited favor. Through Moses, God was about to send a deliverer to the people of God by grace. Nothing they had done to deserve anything. It was all about grace. It was all about love. Through faith in Yahweh, they would be saved from the fiery furnace, the country of Egypt, the system of the world. They would not be consumed by the fire. God had a plan, a plan of redemption, motivated by love and given freely through unmerited grace. The Israelites and Egypt were about to witness God's wonders. God was ready to reveal himself to the world through his spokesman, Moses. And the lover of my soul, creator God, he